So my name's Brendan Stone. I'm a professor in the School of English at the University of Sheffield uh, with a particular interest in mental health. So I run the Storying Sheffield project, um, which is um, a project which is based on an interest in life stories, um, particularly the life stories of uh, people who perhaps have been marginalised or excluded in some way, um, and using kind of interesting ways to um, elicit and produce life stories. So the issue of um, the benefits of telling your own story, I think, um, is a complex one. Um, I don't think it's straightforward. Um, however, I do think that one, a, a kind of a, a human urge, is to define and construct an identity which one can inhabit comfortably. And one of the ways we can do that is through telling, retelling and remaking our story. Um, I would say that that's always done or nearly always done, I imagine, I don't want to be too definitive, um, in dialogue and in relationship. Um, however, the retelling itself can often be intuitive, instinctive and, and private. I'm kind of interested in what happens when we hear other stories. Um, and the way I think about this is that in order to story our own lives, to tell and retell the story of who we are, we need resources with which to do that. And those resources include the stories that are out there, the way others perceive, conceive and construct their lives. So that's why I said earlier um, about the necessity of telling and retelling within relationship and dialogue. One of the big influences on me has been um, the French philosopher and theologian Paul Ricoeur. Um, and in his non-theological work, he talks about and describes a model of human identity as this storied and storying process. Um, for Ricoeur, the material we draw on in order to story ourselves is in part cultural. Um, he sometimes call it, calls it the myths and traditions within which we grow and develop. Um, so a human being, when they wish to address who they are and perhaps retell the story of who they are, um, has available to him or her um, a large amount of resources um, which is out there in culture. Um, the stories, the narrative forms um, that are out there. We take from that, use it as a kind of toolkit in order to retell, retell who we are. I mean, obviously the Bible um, from in, in the West um, is, um, and, and other parts of the world, is a huge resource for many of us to reconstruct the story of of who we are. There are all kinds of interesting narrative forms within the Bible um, which we can draw on and I think that's one of the ways in which um, religious texts can comfort people. They can find stories within it or story forms within it which can fit with their own experience or they can find a place within those story forms that feels like it aligns with themselves, with, with, with their spirit, with who they are. It's interesting because most of my academic career, um, which is now in its 11th year, has been focused on an interest, preoccupation with stories and identity and being, really. And yet, I would say that I'm not particularly a narrative sort of person. So there was a philosopher called Galen Strawson who wrote an article, I don't know how long ago it was, maybe 10, 15 years ago, um, in which he claimed that um, human beings were divided into two types. Um, there was the narrative type and there was what he called the episodic type. And the episodic type don't 
it typically, according to Strauss, and experience their lives in narrative terms. And I actually would say I, I'm like that. Um, so, in one sense, uh, stories aren't useful to everybody. However, I, I would actually kind of challenge Strawson, or not exactly challenge him, but I'd want to go beyond what he says, which is less, so I would want to think less about the ways in which we experience ourselves in the world, and more about the place we find ourselves within just because we're people. Now, whether we personally, in our inner, inner worlds, experience ourselves and our lives as stories or not, I would say does not change the fact that around us we live in a storied world. Um, stories surround us, they make up our social, political, cultural and religious milieu. Um, and we have to inhabit a world in which sense and meaning emerges out of the telling of stories. For me, at a very profound level, we all are storied. Um, even if you have um, significant cognitive impairments, for instance, if your memory is damaged in some way and you're only able to remember things for a very brief period of time, which in and of itself would seem to um, mitigate the possibility of living a storied life, your existence is held within a storied culture and therefore somehow we have to move within a world constructed from stories. I don't think stories are an unmediated good thing um, and I think there are many instances where people's life stories, especially people who have been in some way marginalised, excluded or stigmatised, um, are used in, in quite an um, exploitative way. Um, one has to remember that um, a life story, a story of who I am, um, is something very personal indeed. Um, and the context in which the story is produced and what happens after it has been heard um, need to be need to be right. Um, I also think there's a tendency, stories are very everywhere now, um, and the thing that I'm really interested in is healthcare, social care, social exclusion, and you get loads of story projects in those areas. And sometimes I, I have the sense that only certain narrative arcs are permissible. So in mental health, which, which I'm interested in, um, there's lots of story resources out there on the internet, films and, and, and text and what have you. Um, and quite a lot of them seem to conform to a certain narrative arc, which is roughly along the lines of um, things went wrong, things were very dark, I began to get help. And now, now my life is okay with a bit of help, that sort of thing. Um, and, and for some people that's probably true. Um, but for most people I would suggest uh, it's simplistic. And um, there's a danger if one feels that one's story doesn't conform. In my academic work, when I'm working with, especially when I'm working with people who don't have a lot of resources available to them, um, people who, who may have experienced um, a lot of mental illness over decades perhaps and um, have experienced a lot of exclusion and marginalisation, to try and use stories to help people um, retell um, a narrative in which perhaps hope can be located somewhere. I would draw on my own experience um, and use stories from my own life on occasion, but um, I'm always very cautious about how I do it. So it's easy to think that through sharing stories, we kind of emerge 
onto a similar sort of plane of existence. So I take off my professional trappings of my my kind of I take off my privilege, my social capital, uh, and I make myself vulnerable by sharing some story from my own life. But I think that's naive. You know, you, I can't divest myself of. Um, the relative privilege I enjoy as a, you know, as, as a person with a with a salary and a title and all the rest of it. So while I think it's a good thing to um, trade stories, I think we have to be very self aware and self critical of how we do it and why we're why we're doing it.